Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome back. Not that uh, there's a certain sort of esprit de corps has been let loose up there in the uh, morning tea room, and I think everybody's coming back slowly. Look, if you feel, particularly because this session's going to involve quite a lot of close looking, if you feel like moving down, um, you might enjoy it more. But I mean, do stay put where you are. We're just delighted to have you. Um, now, I'm, just, I'm going to acknowledge, given that this is the start of um, concurrent sessions, I'm going to acknowledge uh, the Kulin Nations people, the five language groups on whose uh, ground we are, and we acknowledge that, and commit to ongoing reconciliation with them and um, other uh, Indigenous peoples. Now, I'd like to welcome now to discuss the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, foundation for Christian identity, given that identity has been such an interesting and sort of developing um, trend in this conference or sort of, uh, you know, uh, discussion point. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Mita Ann Volpe, whom you met uh, in the last session with Greg. She's a Catholic moral theologian. She's the mother of four, including a daughter with Down syndrome, the director of research and at Wesley House in Cambridge, and teaches theology and ethics at Durham University um, in the UK. Her first book, Rethinking Christian Identity, brings contemporary theological themes into conversation with voices from the classical Christian tradition, which is, I think, just developing where we've been going this morning. More recently, her works explored the intersection of ecclesiology and spiritual formation with a particular interest in the Christian identity of children. For the last few years, she's been writing and speaking about the kind of church we must be if we're truly to honour the weaker members. And in this session, she will offer an overview of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, which grounds religious education in the relationship between the Good Shepherd and the child. So please welcome Mita Volpe. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, I'm... I'm wired so I can, I can move about on the stage. This is terrible because the catechesis of the Good Shepherd, these materials are designed to be used with three to six year olds. And part of what I would be doing with those three to six year olds is calling and speaking to each of them by name. And they'd be like, you know, three feet away from me and not all there. So it's terrible that I can't see your, um, that your faces, but I'm really pleased to be here. And this is a subject about which I'm passionate. Um, don't get to do as much of it as I would like because I have these two academic jobs. How did that happen? Um, what I'm going to do is, is start by... I don't like seeing myself that big, sorry. Talking about um, the background to the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. The foundation for the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd really comes from two different sources of inspiration. One is um, the theological anthropology and educational methodology of Maria Montessori. Now, Maria Montessori, as I said earlier, thought that the foundation of all education was the idea that Christ is the teacher, uh, so that in the Montessori classroom, the leader of the class right, is not called a teacher but a guide. Her understanding of the child was that each child is born the seed, ready to grow into whatever it is that the, that the Lord, that God has created that child to be. And the process of education was not about telling the child, directing the child, but allowing the child to follow what it was that God had for that individual child. So the Montessori method of education is, is works-based. Um, so there are, in a Montessori classroom, obviously these are cate catechetical works, but the Montessori classroom would have um, I, things that you could handle, um, things you can touch, things you work with, and you would always restore them back to the shelf. So you'd choose your material if you were a child, and then you'd bring it back. Um, so this, this is why Maria Montessori believed strongly that all Catholic sh schools should be you know, running on this methodology as Christ is the teacher and the Holy Spirit is guiding the child. Um, and Montessori's method has sort of fallen out, um, but the Montessori schools continue. The other source of inspiration is the woman pictured there, uh, that's Sophia Cavalletti. And Sophia Cavalletti was a scripture scholar. She was an Old Testament scholar. Um, and she was asked by a friend, would you please prepare my son for First Holy Communion? And Sophia said, I'm, I'm a scripture scholar. This, this is not what I do. 
But the mother persisted, and Sophia eventually said that yes, she would do it. Um, and so she, she had this child and, and another couple, I think, and just treated them as she would her university students, which I think is hilarious, you know, and, and shared and opened up the scriptures for them and helped them to kind of see their way in. And she made some observations about what really worked well with children um, in that process of preparing these, these boys for First Communion, seeing that what they really needed was the essence of the thing, the charisma, just the essence, that you couldn't present too, too much at one time, just one thing at a time, one individual kind of doctrinal point at a time, and that's how the catechesis runs. Um, at, at one point, she was introduced, as she's developing these ideas, to a Montessori educator and artist, um, John Agobi. And John Agobi helped Sophia, and the two of them worked together to create these materials for the children to use in what would come to be called the atrium, right? It's called the atrium because that's the bit just outside the church where the catechumens would learn things before they were welcomed into the community. Um, she believed, of course, that the Holy Spirit is leading the child and that the place where the child is going to learn is a prepared environment. And what that means is that in the environment where the child is, and this would be our environment here, um, there will be materials, and for her, a true material doesn't spring for the, from the imagination of the adult. It's not about the imagination of the adult. It's about whether or not the child is drawn to that work. So they worked very hard to, to prepare these kinds of materials that were the right shape, the right size, about the right scriptures um, for the children to work with. And in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, the, the role of the guy, the role of the catechist, is to present the materials, not to explain, and then to step back and allow the child to be drawn to whichever part of the atrium he or she is drawn to. And the idea, of course, is that the Holy Spirit is leading the child. Now, what the, this gives you uh, when you have a child who's been through the atrium, you know, three to six and maybe six to nine, I would say this child, the child that did the drawing is probably, you know, probably seven, eight, nine years old. Because what happens in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd is that there's everything that's presented, whether it's something to do with the liturgy or something from the scripture or something like, like this, um, the relief map of Israel, so that children would learn where Nazareth was, where Jerusalem was, where Bethlehem was, um, and learn learned to post the flags, which have the important things that happen. So resurrection, very important birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, the Annunciation. So you, they would begin to get a sense of the places where Jesus went as a background. Um, so they have all of these works together and, and learn to kind of integrate. It's all about integrating in this space where what the child is there to do is never learning as such. It's never called that. It's listening for the voice of the Good Shepherd. Here, we're listening for the voice of the Good Shepherd. The atrium is very quiet, believe it or not. Six to, you know, six to nine-year-olds are quiet in the atrium because they're welcomed um, outside the atrium by the catechist. They're called each by name, each one called by name. You know, I invite Lisa into the atrium. The Good Shepherd, sorry. The Good Shepherd invites Lisa into the atrium. The Good Shepherd invites Edward into the atrium. And the children will line up and process in having been reminded about the quiet of the environment. Once inside, they'll be presented with a, a variety, these variety of works that they can then choose from. Um, and they draw near to God, and that's the point. It's drawing near to God, this, especially for the th three to six year old. Um, the idea is help me draw closer to God by myself. Now I can give you in a little, just a little example of this. I have a daughter who's now 11, but when she was younger, we did this pre-COVID um, on a Friday afternoon. Um, we drove from Durham to Newcastle. Now, you won't know what the traffic on the A1 is like between Durham and Newcastle on a Friday afternoon, but it's not nice. And she said to me one time, I do RE at school. Why do I have to do this? And I was like, well, because you like it. But I didn't say that because she said, no, I don't, as they do. Um, I said, well, what do you do in RE at school? And she said, learn about Jesus. I said, that's fantastic. I'm a theological educator. I think learning about Jesus is great. So what do we do in the atrium? She said, listen for the voice of the good shepherd. Oh, 
I see. She could see the difference between the kind of space that she was in and the kind of relationship that was being fostered in that particular environment. And that's what the, the work of the child in the atrium is for. So what you have here in the, the drawing is, I don't know if you read Italian, but here's a child who's made the connection between being a sheep of the Good Shepherd and participating in the Mass, which is the kind of connections that the catechesis fosters. But nobody told her that. I think that's important. They, they come to understand these things through working with the materials. Right. So what are the materials in the prepared environment? Things that you would find in the atrium. The first thing that you would find is the children, as they process in, they will process to the prayer table. The prayer table would have a cloth appropriate to the liturgical season. They would gather together around the prayer table to begin their, their session in the atrium. Um, they would be reminded about the various, you know, sort of how do we walk in the atrium? How do we talk in the atrium? As little as possible, but speak softly, speak quietly, become peaceful. The Montessori method is about becoming peaceful. So they come, they, they have a sort of centering time at the prayer table, and then the children are invited to go and choose a work, one by one, not all at once. You know, you may go and choose work, go and choose a work. And the catechist may then say, right, I've got, I've got a presentation for these three children here. Would you like to come to a presentation? And the child can say no. Um, I think that's very difficult, certainly very difficult for me as a sort of catechist in training to accept the child can say no. But because the good shepherd is inviting the child, um, we're not compelling them to come. We're not instructing. We're inviting them to listen to the voice of the good shepherd. And if the child's not ready for that work, not ready to be presented, there's no point in presenting it because then you're compelling. You've no longer, you've sort of negated the invitation. It's no longer an invitation if you have to come, right? So the prayer table would be there. Works like this would be there. Um, relief map of Israel. Along with this, there'd be a globe, which would show a little red dot where Israel is, just to give the children a sense of the perspective. Here's the big wide world, and here's this one small place, and this is the place where God chose to come um, be born. There also are a, a many materials for the three to six-year-old that are called practical life, and they are exactly as you would expect, uh, plant care, polishing, um, moving, just moving nuts with a, with a pair of tongs from one dish to the other, you know, just moving them, putting them all in one, moving them back to the other. Those little hands need something to do, something to work with. And they enjoy working with these materials and it, it allows that, that those first weeks that a three-year-old is in the atrium, they can be presented with a lot of these works and then they can have quiet time as they're presented in succession, the other works that are more doctrinal in content. Uh, the baptism and altar works are two works that always stay up in the atrium. So the baptism corner is a very special place where there's a font, there's a paschal candle, and there are all the materials that go along with the, the work of baptism. Um, in, in the baptism presentation, the child is introduced to receiving the light of Christ. They're given a lit candle, <laughs> believe it or not. Yes, you, you hand the child a lit candle. Um, and introduced to all the various elements of baptism. One of the key things of the presentation of baptism is the number of times the sign of the cross is made and to allow the children to make that connection between what does it mean to be signed by the sign of the cross. Um, the altar work is, gives children an opportunity to learn the names of the articles of the mass, um, beginning with just the paten and the chalice and a few things, and then as they grow, they get to learn things like tabernacle, ciborium, those sorts of things. Um, the child gets the opportunity just to lay everything out as it should be on the altar table, um, which also prepares them then to participate in the Mass. They're, they go into Mass, they're going, oh, I know what that is, I know what that is, I know what that is. Um, Maria Montessori, in her book, The Mass Explained to Children, said, Mass is great for children. And she's writing in the 1930s, so this is the old Mass. It seems right, really not good for children. She said, because they can enter into the mystery. But they need to have a sense of what's going on. And during Mass is not the time to explain it to them. So this, in this catechesis, the, the, the three-year-old child would begin to, un, begin to understand what it is that's happening in the Mass. Uh, 
I'll, I'll wait on parables and infancy narratives because I've got those things to show you. Um, the liturgical calendar that you see there um, is actually made up of lots of different tiny little, I thought about bringing mine, I thought, no, that's too, I'll have to reassemble it all after I get off the plane because everything will have come apart. Um, all those little bits come out and there will be a blank, um, just a blank space underneath. And the child learns to put together you know, how the seasons go, what's the progression of the liturgical year, it's, it's cyclical. Um, and after presenting something like the, this particular the liturgical calendar work, you would ask the child, so what do you see? What do you notice? You wouldn't exp say how many of this there are, or how many of that there are. You, you present it, you don't use a lot of words, you invite the child to make observations about it. So the child will say, wow, there's a lot of green. Mm, yeah, I wonder why that is. There's a lot of I wonder, I wonder, allowing the child to learn because you're not the teacher. That's, that, that's the hardest thing for me as a, you know, I'm a lecturer by trade. Um, I'm not the teacher. In the atrium, I'm not the teacher. Christ is the teacher. I'm there to listen for the voice of the Good Shepherd with the children and through the children. All right. The vestments work is just four stands where they learn, again, re-emphasizing the liturgical colors. They put the, the tiny chasubles on the tiny stands and they begin to learn, you know, purple is for preparation, preparation for the feast. White is for celebration. Yeah. Green is the growing season is how they're taught it. And red is for Pentecost. Um, so there's a little song that they do with that, that to emphasize to them, to, to help them to learn and to get used to the rhythms of the church year. So one of the things that we do just before Lent is to bury the Alleluia. So each of the children gets a little something with Alleluia written on it, or if they're old enough, they write it themselves, that they then decorate in color, and then they put it in a sort of waterproof container and bury it. And that's a kind of a big event just before Lent to say, we don't use this word during Lent and to help the children enter into the cycle of what the church is doing, the celebration of the various feasts and fasts of the church's year. Right, now, parables and infancy narratives, I think, are two significant um, elements, particularly if you're thinking about teaching children about what's in the scripture. So the parables include not just the Good Shepherd, which is obviously a central core parable. The, par the Good Shepherd work would always be up in the atrium, just like this. Um, but also the pearl of great price, um, the seed, the mustard seed, all the parables of what the kingdom of God is like. And you'll notice that this is a sort of just two-dimensional, they're flat, okay? Because it's a parable. It's Jesus telling, you know, a parable about himself. And again, we wouldn't explain the parable to the child. You would read it and invite the child to reflect back what he or she heard. Um, now, the infancy narratives, because these are things we want to emphasize, this is the life of Jesus. These are things that really happened. So you get Mary and the angel. They're figurines. Just helping the child to see the difference to make those sorts of connections. How are we doing for time? We're doing okay for time. So I want to explain to you two very significant works um, that I think are the core of, well, the first Holy Communion preparation, at least, in the atrium. And these are the two works that would have allowed the child that you saw, the child's drawing a few slides back. Ooh, this is fantastic. I can do this. Right? This, these are the two works that would allow this child to make this kind of connection. Okay, so there you see a child, probably about three, working with these materials. In the first presentation, the catechist would take the booklet, which somehow I don't have here. The booklet um, would look something like this. Um, but if in it are the words of scripture. Catechist would light a candle, which I've been told I'm not allowed to do in here because the sprinklers will all come down on us. Um, because we're reading the gospel from the gospel. And then the catechist would read very slowly the scripture that talks about Jesus leading the sheep out. And the sheep hear his voice, and they follow him. Okay. 
I won't take the time to take each of the sheep, but that's about the speed. You take each of the sheep out, and they follow the good shepherd till all the sheep are out. Um, and then the sheep get led back in. Um, after the child has had some time to work with these materials, and it's always work, it's not play, um, and that also comes from Maria Montessori, the work of the child is to form the adult that he or she will become. So it's work, this is their work in the, in the atrium as well as in the Montessori classroom. So when the child's become familiar with this work, so this might happen towards the end of their, when they're three. So if you can think about it on the, the sort of academic year, after the first kind of period, first term we would have, it's gonna happen sort of second term, third term, um, after they've become acquainted with the atrium a bit. So that's a sort of three-year-old would get this presentation. But then after a few years, probably their, their third year in the atrium, they would be presented with a work that's called The Eucharistic Presence of the Good Shepherd. I'm going to let someone else take over here um, because Mary Marioni is the, cat is the director of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd in the USA, and I had the good fortune of giving a presentation at, at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, not the one here, and she was present, and I said, do you think maybe, Mary, you could present this one for me? I said, because I'm not, you're an experienced catechist, and I'm not, you know, and you'll do such a good job of it, and I think that you should hear Mary. Um, we are going to start with this because what I'm going to show you, we would take maybe three years, two and a half years to present to the children. It would be very slow and very enjoyable. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to try to pack that into like 10 minutes. So I'm going to rush a little bit. I'm going to presume you know certain things like that you are actually the sheep he's talking about. We give them space to come to recognize that for themselves. Okay, so, and we would start... Many times um, in our sessions, somebody is working with the Good Shepherd and a catechist will come over to read the scripture, maybe a few others would join and there would be this conversation. So I'm gonna start with that conversation. Um, of course, um, I'm going to just lead it. I'm gonna give you what, where the children would go um, and then we'll move into the Eucharistic message, okay? So let's, Remember what we know about Jesus, what he tells us about himself. Remember, people were following him. They wanted to know, who are you? And to help them understand, he said, I am the good shepherd. What are some of the things we remember he said about this shepherd? He calls them each by name, doesn't he? Right? Even though he has many, many sheep, he calls them each by name and he leads them out. And once they've all been led out, what happens? He goes ahead of them. He walks through whatever comes first. He leads them through it all. And they follow him because they know his voice, right? They won't follow a stranger, only their shepherd because they know his voice. Also, I realize I'm moving and talking at the same time, which I wouldn't do with children. So I'm saying that mainly for the catechists here. I'm sorry. I'm moving and talking. <laughs> Just trying to get over there, so. And we know some other things, right? Remember, what did he say about how he knows these sheep? It's like he knows someone else. And we know that knowing is really talking about how much love is between these sheep and the shepherd as much as there is between his father and him. And of course we know who his father is, don't we? Right? God. That's how much love there exists between these sheep and the shepherd. And Jesus, his voice reaches very far because he says, even though <clears throat> I have many sheep, there are those that are not in this fold, and they too will hear my voice, and then there will be one flock and one sheep. How wonderful. We've thought a lot about this, haven't we? We've spent a lot of time remembering this together. 
And today, we are going to think about a particular place in time when the shepherd calls his sheep to be with him. And that is the man. He has called them by name, and they come. But do we see a statue of the Good Shepherd on the altar? We see bread and wine. And yet, we know what our shepherd has. I have come that they may have abundant life. All I am, all I have for that, for my sheep. So we don't actually need to see the shepherd, do we? Because we know he's there. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. All I am, all I have for you. Sometimes, like in my church in Arizona, we have a beautiful icon. Sometimes that's in the back of the Good Shepherd. And we can be very happy when we see it. But do we need to see an image of the Good Shepherd to know he is with his sheep? No. Because we know his words. This is my body. This is my blood. So we can think about this the next time we're at Mass. <coughs> How he lays down his life for his sheep. He gives them all he is in his body and in his blood. Now for the children, we would just stop here because there is a conversation that will happen. Sometimes it happens very quickly. Sometimes it takes a long time. And that conversation is, I'm a sheep. I'm not a sheep. <laughs> we're the sheep. We're not sheep. And this argument will actually go on for quite some time. And we only present this next step once we know that everybody's agreed we are the sheep. Okay? Just to give them their space to come to this. <coughs> and we would begin this conversation again, and we'd move over here again, and we'd be having a delightful conversation. And then we would say, but do we see sheep at mass? What do we know about these sheep? Who are they? And so, and I would have the children help me with this. Let us replace these sheep with people. One sheep has a very special word. He says the words of Jesus. Take this. This is my body. Drink this. This is my blood. All I am. All I have. And of course, he is the priest. Sorry. <laughs> I got confused with one of the little boys. He was so sweet. <clears throat> Good Shepherd has called his own by name, and they have come to celebrate this abundant life that he shares with them in his body. And when you are here in the atrium, you can come and think more about this. You can work with this material. <clears throat> we have his words right here. Was it Brianna? What was her name, Karen? She was reading this booklet. Bridget, very happily, and I do believe she was reading it, even if her eyes can't track words. Um, 
when it, it took Sophia and Gianna many years to come to this, and Sophia said that when they finally presented this, the children looked at them like, what took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> I have seen them do many things um, with these materials. There was one group in particular, very young, I thought they were too young to receive it, but they kept insisting on it, and as soon as I presented this, they couldn't wait to get me out of the way. They brought over all the infancy narrative people and all the apostles from the Last Supper. And they were four. So, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs>I think Mary deserved the time that I gave her today because she gives a really good sense of what the voice of the catechist sounds like at the atrium. And also you get to see on the big screen up close what it looks like when someone who really knows what they're doing moves the materials. Um, and also I think there was a couple of things that, um, that struck me out of what she said, one of which is sort of that last bit about the four-year-old who, who got it just so, so much so you know, all of these, so she would have brought, not the angel, but would have brought all the people from the narrative. So these guys, then all the, the, the wise men, that would be the shepherds, all of the people, um, because all of these people are the sheep. So the sense of the church throughout time as well. Um, it's all connected in the atrium. Now, I have to be honest. If you want to become a level one catechist, which is where you have to start, it takes two weeks of intensive formation. And there's a reason for that. It takes a long time to make these materials because they're all handmade. Um, that's part of the formation of the catechist. Um, I have my own, still unfinished, Good Shepherd work at home. Uh, my daughter, when she was about seven, used to really enjoy, I mean, we came home from the atrium and it was like, it's Friday night. She could watch TV. She, she, want, she actually wanted to do this. Um, but I can remember painting the sheep. You paint each of the sheep. You paint on the face. You, you, I, you, I cut them with a jigsaw. It was a little scary, but I did it. And it, it's, it's a sort of contemplative way for the catechist to enter into what the atrium is like. It's a very peaceful process, painting these works, painting the figurines, building these, these, all these structures. Um, <clears throat> but it takes a long time because I think one of the key principles, and the one that we can really take away, the one that we don't have to be trained for weeks and weeks uh, or make all the materials to take away from us, is that the most important preparation is not this, it's this. The most important preparation, the most important part of the prepared environment is the catechist. In order for the catechist to welcome the children peacefully into a peaceful environment, guess what? You've got to be peaceful inside. And that's hard. Uh, I worked with a catechist years ago, and, and she'd come in and she'd say, you know, I'm not ready for this. I'm not yet peaceful. I really need to just, that's what I need in order to do this. And, and you could see how difficult it was if you're not at, at peace. And you know, I'd say, okay, just, just take the time and we'll do it. So the catechist has to be prepared. The other thing though I think that we can take away, apart from that preparation of ourselves and our own hearts being at peace with Jesus and listening for the voice of the shepherd, is that sense that silence and allowing the children to take time is really good. Um, children can learn to make silence even when they're very young. And that was a radical idea to me when I heard, first heard it <clears throat> in, in the atrium. You can make silence. It's not be quiet, but make silence. Inviting them to do something. Here's something that you can actually make. It's not, it's, we're not just telling you to be quiet. We're telling you to make silence because that's how you hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. So learning how to take those sorts of things away is really important. And I'll just um, close by giving you an example of how this worked for me, because I went back after done, doing the training for three to six-year-olds, and never, I haven't even gotten to level two yet, um, but the three to six-year-olds. Going back to my own parish, there's no atrium. There's no, nobody else is even interested, even heard of the Good Shepherd catechesis. 
And, but they said, well, if you're interested, you can do children, children's liturgy. And I thought, I'm not sure that's, <laughs> that's, that's not the same thing. And I was, um, came up on the Rhoda on Trinity Sunday. And I thought, how on earth am I going to do this? You know, I think there's a part of, you know, sort of, I'm supposed to explain the Trinity to the children. I thought, that's definitely not what I'm supposed to do. Um, that is not the good shepherd's voice speaking to the children. And it was a passage, the gospel that day, was a passage out of John that, that talked about I am in the Father, and the Spirit will come. I can't remember it exactly, it's a long time ago. But we went in and, and I, we started talking about in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the glory. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And we started talking about that. And I said, well, at a monastery, do you know, you know, where I sometimes go and retreat, when they say the Gloria, they bow. Why do you think that is? So we had a conversation about it. And then before I read the gospel, I said, why don't you see if you can listen for that name, see if you hear that name. Um, and afterward, I, I didn't give the coloring sheets. You know, <clears throat> We had a conversation about it. Then I said, okay, paper and, and pens, and that's it. Just free drawing, like that child's free drawing <clears throat> that we had before. Um, go back to the, I can advance the slide now, there we go. That's what we're doing now, we're extending the work. I gave them a chance to do the free drawing, and one of the ch children came back to me, a girl probably about eight or nine, and she'd just drawn this circle. Um, just a circle, and it had these little arrows kind of pointing in the, all in the same direction. And I said, wow, I said, can you tell me about that? And she said, it continues, it continues. So what, what's in the gospel continues with us in the mass. And I thought, well, there you go, you know. And she, that came from her, from her reflection, from her just listening, not, not at anything that I'd explained to her. I, had, I didn't say anything about that. I just read the scripture and we talked about it. So I think it can bear fruit, um, but it requires the preparation of the catechist and a willingness to, to listen with the child for the voice of the Good Shepherd. Right. I actually have three minutes left. Does anyone have a question? Go ahead. Did, did everyone hear that question? We have amongst us a catechist, a real catechist, <laughs> um, with, with an atrium, right, in, in Tasmania, did you say? Yeah. And she's asking, saying, well, it, it's very rare. There are six atria here in Melbourne. Um, one of them, at least, all three levels, is at St. Philip's um, in Blackburn. But what's my advice for getting catechesis, this catechesis into the schools? Because it does, it is so formative and it helps the children with that, connecting actually the works of mercy and everything else that they do with the voice of the Good Shepherd, calling them and sending them out. Um, this is what I do. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, every year that I've got, I keep talking about you know, these sorts of things. And we came, there came a point where our, our parish for a while was run by Dominicans. And poor Father Ben, every time he'd see me coming, you could see him kind of go, what's she going to say now, you know? Um, and, I mean, the reason that I'm here is because I, we met Archbishop Peter in Comensoli many years ago. We've been having conversations ever since. And, I, you know, I've said, you should have this in your, you know, in your diocese. And, and that, that's why I'm here. So I think... It's just continuing to talk about it and talk about it and, and to help people. I want, what I really would like to have had is a room set up as an atrium so that everybody could go in and experience it. And I think you get a little bit of the, of the feeling of what the atrium is like by listening to Mary because she's so peaceful. She presents so beautifully. Um, so just keep persisting and pray. 
that's how I got my atrium. The missionaries of charity said, we have all these works, we've been praying, we think you should have them. Okay, you know. That was, my, that was the thing that was missing for me to open an atrium. And then COVID hit, so I haven't been able to do it. But, you know, yes, that's it. That's all the advice I can give, because it's really hard. Um, but just showing people that it's worth the time and investment, I think, is the most important thing. Right, thanks so much. I'm now at three minutes, so uh, three seconds. So I think we're done. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mita, very much indeed. Um, much appreciated. Um, I always thought the Good Shepherd was a marvellous starting point for a whole lot of things. So.